Hello everyone and welcome to the Constructed Criticism Network. This network is here to help you improve in Magic the Gathering at every level. From popper leagues to top 1000 mythic, we've got you covered. If you want to hear the entire network, head on over to our sponsor at puremtgo.com where you can hear each and every show, each and every week, and check out their sponsor, MTGO Traders, and tell them that the CCMTG Network sent you. Now sit back, enjoy the show, from YouTube, podcasts, and more, here's this week's episode from ConstructedCriticism.com. Hello, everybody. Episode 111 of the Common Knowledge Podcast. I'm your host, Christian, and I'm joined by our, I'm your host, Christian, and I'm joined by our new co-host, Brad. How are you doing tonight, Brad? I am doing great, Christian. How about yourself? Doing very well. Um, I just wanted to uh, appreciate you for taking over the spot that um, Colton left behind, uh, keeping things going. Yeah, that's uh, no problem at all. Actually, I'm pretty honored to be here. Uh, common knowledge has definitely, in my mind, one of the premier if not the premier popper podcast. So, uh, you know, back in the days of Manny and Kyle and Lobbert and Sean and you and Colton, um, it's really good to be here. I got some big shoes to fill, but I'm going to do my best. Yeah, um, <clears throat> we're pretty excited to have you. I did want to say, though, um, before we got too far into this episode, I have to remind everybody that Common Knowledge and all the podcasts on Destructive Criticism Network are sponsored by puremtgo.com. If you guys wanted to support the show, you can make sure to like, share, and subscribe to the Constructive Criticism YouTube channel and check out our Patreon. With all that out of the way, let's get on to the podcast. Um, <clears throat> I guess, actually, before we get too far and we really want to talk about Sure. Uh, we really want to talk about. Sure. Um, I had a couple of questions for you. Um, yeah, shoot. Yeah. When did you start playing Magic? Well, um, it seems to be the hot term is paper boomer. So I guess I would consider myself one of those uh, mid to late 90s paper magic when cards like Frankenstein's monster was wreaking havoc on the LGS events. There wasn't even, I mean, it was barely type 1.5. Uh, mostly it was just a group of people getting together and playing and it was cards like that that seemed to be broken, you know, if you would. Back then, we didn't know much, but it was fun. And that's that's pretty much when I started back then and taking time off here and there, a few years apart. But um, I've been back in it for a few years now, and I'm loving it. Loving every minute of the popper action. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I guess I'm going to show, like, how not paper boomer I am. What does Frankenstein's monster do? <laughs> <laughs> um, I will have to look it up, actually. I should have thought of that. Um, it has been forever since I looked up that card. It's from the dark, um, and it deals two black and X for a summon monster. That's the creature type monster for a zero one. When Frankenstein's monster is brought into play, if you do not take X creatures from your graveyard and remove them from the game, Frankenstein's monster is countered. For each creature removed from your graveyard in this way, you may choose to give Frankenstein's monster a permanent plus two plus zero, plus one plus one, or plus zero plus two counter. And that's taken directly from the card itself. That's not the Oracle tech. Yeah. So I don't want to get too far into the weeds on this card. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> like, yeah, it's uh it's out there. And it's got the great Anson Maddox artwork. He's my favorite. I know we talked about artwork earlier, but uh, if I had to pick a favorite, he is definitely it. Um, well, do you have um, a favorite card from back then at all? Is like whenever you started playing, or is this one it? No, I do. Well, this is up there. Um, it's one of the most memorable. I would have to say, you know, I, I kind of believe that your first stack of magic given to you as a gift, a friend, get you in the game here, take some cards, build a deck. Uh, and that's how I got my first stack of cards. It was one of those hard, clear plastic boxes boxes with the removable lid that i think it held four or five hundred cards i don't know um but he slid it across the table and the top card was facing up and it was a third edition northern paladin and i looked down and i said that looks like bruce campbell i love this game and i don't even know how to play it so <laughs> i would have to say northern paladin for me um so <clears throat> i guess a little bit after that or maybe not what got you into like popper specifically um it had been a while um i'm not one of the popper guys that have been around for a decade or even really five six Six, seven years. It's only been in the last two to three um, years that I've been focused on Popper specifically. I knew of it before, but I never really got into it um, as much as I have recently. And really, um, I know it's kind of a cop out to say, but I think it's the two things that most people think of with Popper is the uh, is sort of the freedom to to brew and be creative with the cards and the dumb. those two things I think should be what magic are about. Uh, they used to be what magic were about, I guess, back in the day, maybe. And uh, I just love it. You know, I can kind of do whatever I want to with the cards, the decks, uh, brew them up, a couple bucks here and there, and you could literally make decks, just endless amounts of decks. It's amazing. Yeah, for sure. Um, <clears throat> so with that, do you have any, like, top 
puffer decks or like decks that you maybe brewed or ideas or anything like that? Um, I tend to, I guess it sort of depends on my, I tend to, I don't play a lot of mono color decks um, unless I'm playing burn or, uh, you know, I used to play elves back in the day, that sort of thing. But when I'm brewing, it's usually a two color deck. Three colors are, they used to be harder than they are now to make work, but they're still not great. Um, unless you're playing something like Tron, which I never really have done. So I, I usually tend to focus on black, red decks, white, black. Orzhov is my favorite guild, um, as far as, I don't know, magic story goes. But Rakdos, black and red, that's probably my favorite archetype to work with. Orzhov is my favorite guild, um, as far as, I don't know, magic story goes. But Rakdos, black and red, that's probably my favorite archetype to work with. Uh, dangerous, It's it, sometimes it's suicidal. So uh, it's just a lot of fun to me you can go aristocrats with it you can do hand destruction land destruction you know a, a burn style um, siphon list uh, there's a lot of options just within that archetype that I, I really enjoy and it's really easy to brew up there's some staples that you kind of have to have in every single black and red deck but outside of that you can go with wherever wherever your mind takes you yeah for sure um, I've also always had an affinity for I guess um, like black red things particularly the like reanimator style deck yeah sure yeah. but is there anything else that like maybe you would want to know about you or anything like that um i can't think of anything specifically knowing me it'll probably slip out later unintentionally um but i just try to keep myself busy whether it's lately it's been you know if i'm not working i'm thinking about magic you know, if i'm not thinking about magic i'm playing mag not playing magic then i'm talking about it it's always it's something to do with popper it's something to do with the game with the cards with boxes or collecting or you know anything like that outside of that I watch a lot of horror movies, listen to a lot of music, and I think that's about it. Music, movies, and magic. That's me in a nutshell. <clears throat> well, then I guess outside of that, we can uh, sort of get on to what we would sort of consider, I guess, like our normal show for the week. Um, we always start things out by just talking about sure. what decks yeah. we've been playing. You're uh, regularly scheduled. Okay. <clears throat> so um, I guess I'll go ahead and start. The um, decks that I've been playing um, should be no surprise to anyone, and that's the like Red Scred decks, um, Fall from Favor recently was released mm -hmm. <laughs> and <laughs> I think quite an that, impact. yeah i think that card is um incredibly insane um i don't know other people's experiences with it i will say that sometimes my opinions on whether or not cards are fun don't match up with other people's i think the card is a lot of fun um right. but i know not everyone feels like that but it's definitely yeah. incredibly powerful though uh, so with the holiday and everything uh I haven't played a lot of MTGO lately. Um, I was kind of waiting for Commander Legends to drop, and then the holidays hit, and then I saw there was a bunch of people having issues with bugs and cards not playing properly, I suppose, on Magic Online. So, and coupled with that, I was really missing the paper play, uh, paper magic. So I've been spending a lot of time on Spell Table, and with that said... Um, one deck I've been playing a lot of is actually Tortured Existence, just your basic black-green stock list of it. Uh, I did not realize how fun this deck is. You know, everyone says, oh, it's a toolbox deck. You can kind of do whatever you want. You can get whatever you need. Um, and that sort of just went over my head until I actually sat down and, and played a handful of matches with it. It's really, really a beautiful deck. I mean, there's so many options. It's, it's nearly endless. You can just pull up every popper legal card that's black and every popper legal card that's green and you know some way or another you could probably find a way to get them in that deck uh, there's so many it's just so much to play i've had a lot of fun playing that one <clears throat> the list that you're playing are there any um like fun cards that people should know about um i had never actually played this archetype or this deck before so i've just pretty much picked up the first sort of stock shell stock list that i found on i, I believe mtg top eight something that finished rather high in an event in an event um in the last year or so and just went to tcg player and picked it up uh so it's pretty straightforward with the brown scales and um horror of the broken lands you know stuff like that it's nothing crazy i haven't been able to sit down and actually brew with it but i got some things in mind that i'd like to try with it there's a, quite a few people i talk to that that run three color tordex whether it's mardu or abzan and uh, it seems like white is probably going to be a pretty good addition to the deck you know you got your enchant the titular Portrait Existence card, you know, you can pull that out of your deck, put it on the table. Uh, so that might be a, an area I want to get into, but I need to get familiar with the, uh, just the straight up, yeah, an area I want to get into, but I need to get familiar with the, uh, just the straight up black green list before I venture into something a little more complicated. That's how yeah, I feel I, on it. 
Yeah, I will say um, of the more complicated ones, I've always been like sort of into the idea of like a Jun tortured existence deck, just because I yeah. think things like um, Faithless Looting, Cathartic Re are like incredibly powerful cards. But, yes, absolutely. I did. Um, um, I, I was kind of brewing around with a. I didn't even put it together, but I was just brewing around with a list, a Jund tortured existence list. Um, yeah, and it had it had that same thing. It had discard effects. Faithless looting was, you know, obviously a staple four of in there. Um, uh, I think I put it. It didn't. I don't know. I didn't like it. It ended up being a reanimator slash tortured existence list, and it just kind of got out of control, and and I put it away. I didn't even want to build it after that. You know, it ended up being the dragon's breath and crushers and all these big creatures that you just brought back with the zoom and i thought well now i'm just brewing a reanimator deck that i slammed tortured existence into and all these big creatures that you just brought back with the zoom and i thought well now i'm just brewing a reanimator deck that i slammed tortured existence into and that's not really where i wanted to start with that so i need to go back to the drawing board for sure well i guess with uh that segment out of the way we can sort of get into our main topic of the week which is um we wanted to go into i guess like um a historic magic set and sort of talk about some of the cards in it and sort of do like a mini set review for it um <clears throat> what was the uh, set that we went into this week we we decided to go back to 2007 and look at lorwin and um all the cards that have had a impact on our format or cards that frankly we wish would have an impact on our format. Uh, it's one of my favorite sets. I don't believe that I was playing in 2007, but uh, I knew of it. I knew of Lorwyn. You know, I'd see the artwork in the stores and on the packs and, and everything. And as soon as I got in Pauper, I could see immediately the impact it had on it. So I've kind of been in love with that set ever since. Yeah, Lorwyn is sort of such like um, a hit regardless of like what kind of magic player you are. Because I thought that um, for the most part, the mechanics were cool and fun. Um, all the artwork and sort of like the lore behind it, from what I understand, is also pretty amazing. And it also has yeah. one of my favorite mechanics probably of all time, which is a vote. I really like the concept. I, of I would the have to agree space. with you. Yeah, yeah, that's a great one. Um, there are plenty of evoke cards in the set. Um, probably only two or three that actually see play, but I, I'm with you. I like them all. I think it's a cool mechanic, very useful. Um, anything that lets you choose anything modal, you know, and these are basically modal creatures for the most part. Uh, these can't really go wrong with that, I don't think. I agree. Um, I also really always like cards that um scale with the length of the game, and evoke is sort of like just like the prime example of um, something that does that. Uh, yeah, I agree. <laughs> but um, anyway, so what we did was we basically sort of looked through it, and we found a lot of the cards that we think either we want to have an impact on Pop or do have a You can go ahead and sort of get right into the cards that we found. Um, the first one being um, like a great colorless artifact, which is Springleaf Drum. Yep. Yeah, um, this is, um, I would say, I mean, we didn't, I don't think we intentionally put it at number one on the list, but I would say it's in the top handful of cards from this set that are uh, seeing play and popper on the regular basis. Absolutely. Yeah, I don't know, especially for those um, like either turbo creature decks or um, like I think the like sliver set, for example, uses it in a really unique way of just it allows you to have access to so many colors of mana and still place a lot of your things relatively on curve. Um, sure. Do you want to read it for him? Yeah, let me pull up the exact text real fast just so I don't uh, basically misquote it at all. So it's a one mana artifact. You tap it and you tap an untapped creature you control and you add one mana of any color to your mana pool. Um, that's sort of the beginning and the end of it. But that's yep. just such an incredibly powerful effect. And sometimes I think, like, if you read it, you all really of your mana is just so powerful. Yep. I remember, uh, like I said, I wasn't around when Lauren came out, but. I was playing pretty decently uh, around that Born of the Gods time when Springleaf Drum was reprinted. And and you're right. I saw it. It was an uncommon. I think at that time it may have been a buck or so, and I just didn't really get it. You know, I looked at it. I'm like, okay, I don't really play artifacts, so I don't see what the uh, what the draw is with it. And every time I cracked one or pulled one from a pack, somebody wanted to buy it or trade for it or or what have you. And I was happy to get rid of them at the time, but... You know, that's not knowing what I know now, obviously. <laughs> yeah, I definitely understand what you um, So then next on our list, we had a one-mana sorcery for blue. What's that one-mana sorcery? That one, um, I think most people have heard of this one, and you're right. It is the one-mana sorcery for blue. It is Ponder. Um, I think this is probably the most classic artwork that Ponder has seen. Um, I love it. The Merfolk, you know, back and forth. Martin, actually, um, so I probably shouldn't have tried. 
But no, ponder, it's a sorcery for one blue. Look at the top three cards of your library, and you put them back in any order. You may shuffle your library, and then you draw a card. This card sees play in just about every deck that plays blue. Would, would you say that's a correct statement? Yeah, for the most part. Um, <clears throat> it even sees play in like, um, things like Tron from time to time. I'm not sure if it's like the most popular option. Mm, yep. But I don't know. It's basically like if you're playing a blue deck, you should play Ponder. It's just um, so incredibly efficient yes. and just really good at what it does. I don't know. I really don't know a different way to put it. And it's, um, no, you're absolutely right. It's that design space where, just like you said, it's it does exactly what you want it to do. Um, if you have a deck that cares about spells, it's perfect. Um, if you have a deck that you want to dig for your win condition or your combo piece, it's perfect. Andy in so many situations. So. <laughs> Yeah, um, I would say that the next card on the list maybe perfect Andy in so many situations. So yeah, um, I would say that the next card on the list maybe isn't as universal as Ponder, but um, it's still just like an incredible staple of the format. And that's gonna be Spell Stutter Sprite. Um, for anyone that yes. doesn't know, Spell Stutter Sprite is a two mana one one fairy wizard with flash and flying. And when it comes into play, you counter target spell with converted mana costs X or less, where X is the number of fairies you control. Um, this is probably a card that didn't actually need the introduction, because if you've played Popper in um, <laughs> even minor ways, you've probably played against this card a lot. Yeah, you've had something countered by this card, guaranteed it. I don't know, it's funny, when I first started playing Popper, um, I didn't really like know anything about the meta or whatever. And it's like, you just get like, you're mm -hmm. like, one mana like um like creature or whatever just like countered by spell starter sprite and you're like wait this card exists and then it's like after that like one time maybe one time maybe you have yeah. to play something into it like a second or third time to really understand that that card's everywhere and you're like all right i'm not losing to this yeah. card anymore and then you still do but yeah it just yeah the first couple times you get hit by it you know you get countered by it it just feels so degrading so powerful um, yeah, you have to read it. You have to kind of confirm that it's even playable in our format because it just every time it every time it hits the field, it just it sort of comes out of nowhere. I mean, you know it's coming, but it's still just a surprise every time. Yeah, I think that's um, a really, really, really good way to put it. <laughs> um, yeah, and then after that, we have our just another pretty good blue card. Um, this yeah, one. imagine that another powerful blue card. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yep. This one is for you folks at home, Mull Drifter. The famous Mull Drifter. Uh, blue and four for creature elemental. Two, two, flying. When Mull Drifter comes into play, you draw two cards. Yeah, that's okay. Um, but like Christian alluded to earlier, this is, I believe, the first one on our list that has the evoke. Blue and two, you can evoke this creature, which that means you may play this spell for its evoke cost. If you do, it's sacrificed when it comes into play. So essentially for a blue and two, you can draw two cards. I yeah. think that's usually pretty good. That's usually enough to step you ahead of, of your opponent in a pretty significant way. Yeah, that's um, <clears throat> it's super powerful at that. And then also, like, if you're playing a deck like Tron, where, like, sometimes you just have inordinate amount of mana, you get to play this, like, flying 2-2, draw two cards. Or, um, you know, if you have, like, a copy of Ephemerate, you can pay four mana to have a 2-2 draw, what is it, like, four cards? Yeah, so. yeah. Once you get flicker effects um, in with the Mull Drifter, some crazy stuff can happen, for sure. Mm -hmm. Then, after that, we finally get away from blue to talk about... Just for a, a little bit. Uh, yeah, to talk about a white enchantment known as Oblivion Ring. Um, costs a white and two. Whenever it enters the battlefield, exile to another target non-land permanent. And then when Oblivion Ring leaves the battlefield, return the exile card to the battlefield. A little bit. Yeah, to talk about a white enchantment known as Oblivion Ring. Um, costs a white and two. Whenever it enters the battlefield, exile to another target non-land permanent. And then when Oblivion Ring leaves the battlefield, return the exile card to the battlefield under its owner's control. Very strong. Yeah. Now, I know um, that we have... Oh, go ahead. Yeah, it's uh, pretty strong. Um, I will say that a lot of times this is the type of card that contends with a lot of the other cards in Popper's format, or in the Popper format, which is um, sort of like my favorite design space with cards, where like sometimes it's really good, and then other times like another narrowly edges it. So that makes this to me like sort of like the ideal Popper card. But Sure. And I, I think you bring up a good point. And when you do see a Living Ring in the deck, I, I don't know the last time I saw two or more. You know, it's it's usually a one of, maybe another one in the sideboard, maybe two in the sideboard total. But 
um, you're right, it competes with other cards in that same realm, even though it is powerful in its own right. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I don't know, it, it's still, I, I really like Oblivion Ring, as well as cards like it, um, like Journey to Nowhere, stuff like that, so. Mm -hmm. Yep, and that's where you, you'll, you'll usually find it, at least um, in a lot of the decks you see that, maybe not Mono White, uh, Mono White doesn't tend to use a lot of three mana non-creature spells, um, but anything that, that involves white and it's any sort of control deck, you'll often see two or three Journey to Nowhere and then one Oblivion Ring. You know, to cover the, the Journey to Nowhere is cover your creatures, your opponent's creatures, and that Oblivion Ring will get rid of any um, problematic enchantments or um, artifacts that, that you're facing down. So that's where that comes into uh, to play. Yeah, especially these days, whenever they uh, fall for favor or fall from favor your creature, you can at least remove the fall from favor. <laughs> that way your creature can get back in and steal that monarch. But Right. <laughs> yep. Hopefully the next turn. Yep. Then, that's a good point. I hadn't thought about that. Maybe uh maybe Oblivion Ring. I'll see a little bit of an uptick in play now with the uh fall from favor. We'll see. I hope so. And yeah, after that, that's a good card. It's a very good card. It is. After that we uh as, well, let's, let's just uh I'll name it first. It's Triclopian Sight. For a white and one, it's an aura enchantment with flash. Enchant creature when Triclopian Sight comes into play. Untap enchanted creature. Enchanted creature gets plus one, plus one, and has vigilance. Um, I believe that when I first started getting into or paying more attention to the competitive pauper metagame, um, mostly online, this was still you know, pre-corona, so there were a lot of paper events reporting to places like Goldfish and MTG Top 8. Uh, this card showed up in quite a few mono-white heroic decks, uh, enough that I, I went ahead and picked up a play set of it, even though the decks, I think they were playing maybe one or two of them. Um, this deck, this card uh, in particular, I don't think would be great if it didn't have Flash, but, I mean, it does, so... It, it is a strong card. It didn't see play for more than, I don't know, three or four months, but for some reason, every heroic deck had this card, at least one copy of it in there. Um, and it works. I just think it gets out of class by one copy of it in there. Um, and it works. I just think it gets out of class by a lot of the other aura enchantments we have in the format. So I don't know what initially started the, the play of this card, but um, it was fun. It was good. I tried it out at the LGS a couple times. Um, I eventually took it out because there are just better enchantments, but um, I gave it a shot and it, it was worth it for a little while. Yeah, so I will say um, this card to me, um, whenever it was seeing play, <clears throat> and um, even still to me seemed more of like um, just like one of those really fun cards to play because it's really fun gets you know, like they tack what they think is going to be something safe and then just flash it in and tap that creature and block, so. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yep. Yeah, without flash, this card doesn't really do a whole lot. Yeah. Then the, um, I think it's basically, basically unplayable without flash. <laughs> for sure. Um, up next, we have a um, card called Wispmare. Um, costs a white and two. It's a 1-3 elemental creature with flying. And whenever it comes into play, and destroy target enchantment. Um, Wismare, to my knowledge, sometimes seems play and like seems play and like sideboards and stuff like that. Um, mm -hmm. I, It'll show up there every now and then. I really like it, especially in um, the like Jeskai Flicker decks where you're playing like Ghostly Flicker or Ephemerate. Because like if you go up against like um, Boggles, for example, you can play Wismare, Flicker it, destroy two of their enchantments, have a creature in play. It's sort of like everything that you want in that sort yeah, of matchup. Keep, yeah, just keep keep pinging them off. But <clears throat> I don't know. This is probably a card that. Again, I really like the evoke mechanic, so I wish it saw more play. Um, and who knows, maybe this is another one of those cards that'll see more play now that Fall from Favor is um, currently all over the format. Yeah, it, it very well could. It's, um, I know we have a lot of white, you know, one one white spells that get rid of a, a artifact or enchantment, but um, this also comes with the body, the fine body if you need it. So I still, even though it does not see play. And where are we at on the list here? The next one, we move to Swamps. Uh, um, are number eight on our list here, we've got uh, the tribes in general were a big deal. You had your goblins and fairies and wizards and elves and um, changelings, which, you know, they're some of my favorite it's not really cheating to say, but changelings are some of my favorite creature types, even though they're every creature type. But I just love them. They're easy to brew with. Uh, they're never super strong. They're never going to win you a tournament or anything like that. But uh, I like them. And the Tribal Instant, I don't know if many people are familiar with it. This particular card, Nameless Inversion, is a black and one for a Tribal Instant shapeshifter. And the text reads, Changeling, this card is every creature type at all times. Target creature gets plus three, minus three, and loses all creature types until the end of the turn. Um, this is another one 
much like some of the other cards on this list where you look at it and you think, okay, fine, it's just your basic removal spell. And, that, and that's what I thought for a long time too, but it's it's really one that can, you know, if you're going up against a tribal strategy, for example, if you're going up against slivers and you manage to take out one of them, it's really one that can, you know, if you're going up against a tribal strategy, for example, if you're going up against slivers and you manage to take out one of their lords with this card, you know, that that's strong right there. That that just sets their whole game plan back at least a turn, probably two, um, swung it in your favor pretty heavily. And uh, it can be found if you have a way to tutor up creatures. You know, it can be found with, I don't know, Goblin Matron. Um, I don't know how, how many other real tutors we have for creatures in the format, but um, that one just the first one that comes to mind. You got anything on Nameless Inversion, Christian? Yeah, so um, in the beginning, you spoke on how powerful, like, modal cards and modal mechanics were. Um, yes. And that's something that I think gets missed about, like, these types of cards. Um, I would put Agony Warp, like, sort of, like, in the same vein. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's, like, it's like, I think Agony Warp, like, is oftentimes just, like, viewed as, like, really it's a room and a debuff. And this can be removal, or so I would say sure. this card is yeah, probably... 8-2, uh, that's not bad. Yeah, I would say this card's probably solidly underrated because of something like that. Yep, I agree. Um, yeah, it's definitely going to be one where you play it, and more than likely, you know, if you're in paper sitting across from the table from someone, I don't know when that's going to be next, but you play it, they're probably going to want to read it if it's a newer player. So it's just one of those cards. And then after that... And the yeah. next one... Yep, go ahead. We had um, another tribal instant. This one is a fairy, though. For one black, target creature gets negative one, negative one until end of turn. And if you control a fairy, draw a card. Yeah, I did. I think I snuck this one on the list as cards that I wish were more playable. Um, it, every line of the card, every every word on here is great. It's a tribal instant. It's fairy, which is a very relevant creature type. Um, target creature gets minus one, minus one until the end of turn. That hits a lot of creatures in our format. If you control a fairy, draw a card. I guess it doesn't do enough of any one of those things to be truly playable. Do enough of any one of those things to be truly playable. But I still really, I just really, I really enjoy this card a lot. Yeah, um, I really, really like the idea of this card. Um, I don't know. I would yeah. say that if this was like disfigure attached to the draw card, um, which for people that don't know, like a minus two, gives, minus two. Exactly. I would say that this card would probably be almost like a staple of the format. But even now, I could definitely see this point. getting into the like blue black fairy list at some point. And honestly, I almost want to like sure. brew something with this card just because of um, I think it's pretty powerful and it does a lot of different things. And I would like to see like um, how far you could stretch it. Yeah, absolutely. The artwork's kind of cool. Rebecca Gay art, the fairy flying around the goblin. Oh yeah, no, the um, artwork for this yeah, card is actually um, one of the more fantastic ones, I would say. And that's from a yeah. set with a bunch of great artwork. Yeah, <laughs> that's saying a lot. Absolutely. Um, up next, speaking of we're cards, on uh, the next, yep. The more fantastic ones, I would say. And that's from a yeah. set with a bunch of great artwork. Yeah, <laughs> that's saying a lot. Absolutely. Um, up next, speaking of we're cards, we're on uh, the next, yep. Oh, sorry. Speaking of cards with, um, I no, think, go, go right cool ahead, yeah. artwork is um, Mournwell, which is um, probably a card that I wish saw play as opposed to a card that does see play. Um, <laughs> it costs a black and six, which is a really hefty mana cost for an elemental. Whenever it comes into play, target player discards two cards. You can evoke it for a black and three, and it's just your standard three three. Um, I wish this card called card saw play. I think it's cool. It is very cool. Um, and according to the flavor text, it hoards Lauren's rare sorrows for what that's worth. Um, yeah, I did. Uh, there was a point I was trying this card out. Um, you know, like I said at, at the beginning, I'm kind of a, I grew up in old school magic. So hand disruption, you know, I love those kind of decks, sinkhole, him to Turok, all that stuff. Um, so naturally I always sort of gravitate toward black cards that make any player disc red like aristocrat style deck because you do get that sacrifice trigger when you evoke um so something like this you know for a black and three you get a sacrifice trigger for your carrion feeder or your mortician beetle and your opponent discards two cards or you can discard them if you have something you need to pitch to bring back later you know this i, I think there's a lot more modes on this card than it appears to be depending on what what deck you want to put it into. Yeah, sure. Um, what card did we have up now? Ingot Chewer, another evoke creature. Yeah, so um, Ingot Chewer costs a red and four. Um, it's another one of those three threes. Whenever it enters battlefield, destroy target artifact, but you can evoke it for mm -hmm. a singular red. 
Yep, it's like the red uh, version of Wispmare, kind of, but this one hits Artifact. Yeah, I um, I have played this card a fair bit in, um, <clears throat> like, just, like, normal, um, like, reanimator sideboards. So, um, I don't know, I... I yeah. played it a lot. I think you could probably play it in like blue red deck stuff like that. I just think it's um, sure. so, um I don't know. I I yeah. played it a lot. I think you could probably play it in like blue red deck stuff like that. I just think it's um, sure. a pretty fun card to play. Uh yeah, even just like uh with Morn Welk, uh, I would often anytime I'm playing a black red aristocrat style deck, I've got at least one or two ingot chewers in my sideboard. Um it's excellent to kill an artifact for one red and get a sacrifice trigger. It basically says one red, destroy an artifact, put a plus one, plus one counter on any creature you control for the most part. It's pretty powerful in that style of deck. So I'm with you there. Yeah, for sure. Yep. Next card on the list, Christian, is probably out of Lorwyn, is probably the most played red card that is legal and popper. I would think. What do you think? Uh, yeah, I would say so. I would say um, <clears throat> this card sees a fair bit of play. Yep, absolutely. Um, one deck in particular plays a lot of it. Uh, for one red, you get an instant that says Neil Drop deals one damage to target creature or player that was dealt damage this turn, and you draw deals one damage to target creature or player that was dealt damage this turn, and you draw a card. Pretty straightforward. Um, it's a little bit of a conditional card. You got to make sure they do have taken. You got to make sure they have taken damage this turn. But other than that, one red deal another damage and draw a card. I think that's pretty powerful. Yeah, no, I um, <clears throat> I definitely think it's powerful. Um, one of my favorite sort of like ways to set this card up is um, by like suspending like a rift bolt or something like that <clears throat> and then you just get to play it draw yeah, a card that's perfect um yep and a little bit later in burn you know it works well with curse of the pierced heart guaranteed one damage that's automatically going to enable your needle drop it's perfect yeah um <clears throat> i don't know this card allows you to sort of keep hands that maybe you otherwise wouldn't that like um <clears throat> maybe this isn't like um good per se but i've definitely like playing burn like if i have a hand that like has one land but it has a bunch of three damage spells and like two of those are rift but those is like the needle drop i'll like go well i have needle drop really tempting when you see it anything any red card that says draw a card is always very tempting to me <laughs> you and i are the same <laughs> i don't know it's a very juicy line of text it is. Um, but now we can move into a different color yeah um up next we have a four mana three three green green and generic for an elf warrior. Um, whenever you play an elf spell, you may put a one one green elf warrior creature up in play. Of course, I'm talking about Lisa Lana Huntmaster. Um, this card's probably one of the better cards in the elves deck. Um, I think it's very very powerful. Yep, I'm always surprised when I don't see it in the elves deck. I mean, I'm no elves professional pilot. Um, I talked to a few of them, but. Yeah, whenever I see this card not in the deck, it always kind of surprises me. I mean, I can sort of make out the logic behind it, but yeah, it's it just seems like, a, I mean, that's its home to me. You know, as long as I've known this card, it's always been in some sort of elves deck, whether it was Popper or any other format or even Kitchen Table elves deck, the logic behind it. But yeah, it's it just seems like, a, I mean, that's its home to me. You know, as long as I've known this card, it's always been in some sort of elves deck, whether it was Popper or any other format or even Kitchen Table elves deck. It's just, that's where it goes. You know, you, you start your deck with, with the Huntsmaster. Yeah, for sure. It's, um, I <clears throat> sort of feel the same way that um when i was playing um this was like probably one of the banes of like my kitchen table magic experience that like whenever we <laughs> i joke but it's like whenever we started to become i guess more self-aware of like synergy and stuff like that um tribes were like one of the main things that everyone runs to and it's like i didn't really have like a concept of like oh man this card just creates so much card advantage and board advantage but that's like exactly what this card does and yeah 100 percent that's exactly what it does. And after that, um, we get into a green enchantment for a green and one. Um, it's called Fertile Ground. It enchants any land. Whenever that land is tapped for mana, you get to add another mana of any. A lot of times that deck does need help with uh, mana fixing, you know, with all the different enchantments they run. Sometimes they're running um, black pips, red pips, blue, white. Um, so they need all the help they can get. And this one fits right in, adds to their ethereal armor buff, the total there. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I would mean, say that this. Mask. Yeah, for sure. I would say this card's main competition is um, Utopia Sprawl, which um, enchants forests. Yes, absolutely. For a single green. Um, I will say though that a lot of times I see this card, it's like Utopia Sprawl five or six. Um, yeah, yeah. This definitely does not take place of Utopia Sprawl. So if you're using Fertile Ground, it, you're right. It's probably Utopia Sprawl five, six, and seven, five through eight, even. Yeah. 
Um, <clears throat> it's um, still a really powerful card, though, and something that I will say that it has over Utopia Sprawls. It can enchant any land. So if you're wanting to play like more duels or anything like that, you at least have that going for you. Yep. Or like if your hand yep, is absolutely. clunky with just all of yours, is like um, at least can be attached to those to get that enchantment count up. Yep. Yeah, it adds to your like quick and in, in the right deck. For sure. But anyways, um, I um, guess I do want to deviate. Oh, go ahead. No, 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 go on. I was gonna say I do want to deviate before we go back to red for the next card. Um, I always think Lignify is such a sweet card. I don't know if it's just me. I don't know if it's the brewer in me. Um, maybe because it's a tribal enchantment tree folk for some reason I love it. Um, but Lignify is a green and one tribal enchantment. It enchants any creature, and the enchanted creature becomes a zero four tree folk with no abilities. I think that's just hilarious. So I really like much just. Just stop anything. Yeah, I love the concept of um, all cards like this. For some reason, I like the idea of taking a creature and turning it into a different type of creature. Um, yes. And that's, yeah. in, <clears throat> that's in any format. Um, there's, like, one card with this ability that I, like, or a, a similar ability that I really don't like. Um, that was Oko. But outside of that, every card that does something like this in every format does something like this in every format, I'm a pretty big fan of. <laughs> <clears throat> Um, there's yeah, like the, I'm with you there. I am too. There's the white one that turns something into like an indestructible one-one insect. Uh, like these cards are just like a flavor win, a mechanic win. Yes, they offer, on, yeah, yeah. Yep. They offer like um removal oftentimes to colors that only get weird removal. So yeah, these cards are great. yeah, they're and they're hilarious. A, a lot of times when you you, know, you plop something like this down on your opponent's creature, they just don't <laughs> know what to do with it. A lot of times it just completely throws them off their game plan for a turn or two. Even if this card probably won't ever win you a game. It's still pretty uh, interesting and fun to play with if you like those sort of uh, sort of games. I do, anyway. Yeah, no, I definitely do. Especially, like, um, Lignify specifically is, like, one of those cards that, like, if your opponent plays it on you and, like, you've never heard of it, like, you look at it and, like, you guys, like, share a laugh for some reason. Yeah. Like, man, this yeah. is hilarious. Yeah, the artwork's kind of comical. You know, the guy's drooping. He's, I, I don't know. It's hilarious. I think it's great. Bulgo <laughs> is his name, apparently. Oh, is that the artwork's kind of comical. You know, the guy's drooping. He's, I, I don't know. It's hilarious. I think it's great. Bulgo <laughs> is his name, apparently. Oh, is that what it says in the flavor tech? Yeah, Bulgo paused, puzzled. <laughs> what was that rustling sound, and why did his feet feel so stiff? Or no, why did he feel so stiff? And how could his feet be so thirsty? He got thirsty feet. <laughs> you know, with a name like that, I wonder, like, what tribe he belonged to before he was a tree folk, because I would just assume that that's a tree folk name. The Bulgo? Yeah. Yeah, he, he kind of looks like a giant um in the picture but yeah yeah you're right that is a definitely a tree folk kind of bulgo that's awesome um uh, back to um <clears throat> i guess getting into red um the first card that we wanted to talk about there um costs one red and it deals two damage to target creature or player um it's a tribal instant it's Harfire. <clears throat> um yep. Harfire, i think sort of has the advantage that um nameless inversion also had except for this one clearly goes into like the and I think it's more, I play goblins quite a bit. I don't play typically the goblin matron build, um, but I, I tend to think the tar fire is a little more flavorful than it is playable, but maybe that's just, <laughs> maybe that's just me. <laughs> Probably just me. So I sort of uh, maybe don't want to agree with what you just said, but will anyways. It's yeah. <laughs> um, like, it's never going to be better than lightning bolt, even though you can neuter it if you have to. It, you're right. You're absolutely right. And that's, that's kind of what, um, you know, that, that's sort of the bar that we have to compare. If it's got a red pip, we have to compare it to lightning bolt and it just doesn't, it's not, doesn't stand up. Yep. <clears throat> so, uh, the next one's on here cause it's another one, another black card that, uh, has to deal with fairies that I wish was playable and it's just not. And that is dream spoiler witches for a black and three, you get a, a fairy wizard with flying. And whenever you play a spell during an opponent's turn, you may have target creature get minus one, minus one on black and three. You get a, a fairy wizard with flying. And whenever you play a spell during an opponent's turn, you may have target creature get minus one, minus one until the end of the turn. And it is a two, two. This is another one of those similar to, I think pepper smoke, where if the neg one, neg one was 
I don't know, maybe minus two, minus two, or I don't know, something other than the text that's on there. It might be a little more playable, but um, as it is, I like it. The artwork's hilarious. Um, I don't know if they're stealing his, oh, I guess they're spoiling his dreams by dumping um, some nastiness on his forehead. It's hilarious. <clears throat> um, I don't know. I, something that I'll say about this kind of card is that this, in theory, is one of my favorite types of cards. Um, anyone that knows me knows that I really like the draw-go style of decks. The issue with it is that this card okay. itself doesn't play into it because there's a turn where you have to go shields down. Like I think this card would actually be excellent in those style of decks if you if you like an X on it. Or if it was a little bit cheaper so you could get it on an early turn. But also yeah, I think four man is that's a big ass that, that black and three. Yeah, but I think if this card cost something like two mana, it would just be like so good in those decks that um maybe it wouldn't be that fun to play against, to be honest with you. So Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, two mana, I think that would be, it would almost be oppressive. I don't know. I, I would like to see a world where this card has flash. Maybe we can, uh, I don't know. If yeah, I wanted to, like that you know, I've looked at this card for years and wanted to play with it for years and brewed with it a little bit. And even as I was reading it two minutes ago, I wanted to say it had flash. You know, just it just naturally feel. I guess because it's a fairy, I just automatically assume it has flash, like every other oppressive fairy in our format. <laughs> yeah, um... I definitely agree with you. And like I said, if like it feels like this should go into like one of those like draw go style decks with a lot of like card draw spells, stuff like that. And cards yeah, with flash you're just definitely back, play into that yep. a lot. Yep, I agree. Yeah. Um I guess we can get into uh the, the final last card on. card. Yep. And it's not even so much a card as it is a, a sort of series of cards. Probably my all time favorite magic creature type, even though it's a little cheating, like I said earlier, but um, they're just, they're so much fun. I think you can do a lot of, a lot of silliness with them. Um, some of them are powerful. None of them are overly competitively powerful, if you want to call it that, but they all can do something. They all have a, something interesting, some interesting effect or, um, synergy. You can put them into any deck really that cares about any sort of tribe, whether it's slivers or elves or fairies or giants even, or elementals, it doesn't really matter as long as you got two, three, four of a creature type, you throw a couple changeling in, all of a sudden you got double that amount. You know, I think they're a lot of fun, personally. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I'm a pretty big fan of changelings. I will say <clears throat> that I don't think that they are my favorite creature type, but they sort of have to be, I guess, at least in, like, <laughs> one one-hundredth of changelings have to be my favorite creature type. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and they did different. get a big boost with um, uh, Zendikar. Was Zendikar rising with the party mechanic? Yes, at least in, like, <laughs> One one hundredth of changelings have to be my favorite creature type. So, <laughs> <laughs> yep. And they did different. get a big boost with um, uh, Zendikar. Was Zendikar rising with the party mechanic? You know, they don't count for every single. You know, one changeling isn't every single um, party member, but they do add towards the party count. So they get a little bit more playable. Not super, but anything for my my changeling tribe. As um, a short aside. I wish the party mechanic itself was a little bit more playable. Um, <laughs> I do too. I've I've tried to actually on our show notes here um, with the decks that we talked about that we've been playing. My what I had in there originally was this mono red ardent electromancer brew, um, and it just it, it wasn't good. I don't know how else to say it. It was really fun, but it was just not very good. It played a lot like goblins, but way slower than goblins and a lot. Um, a lot more vulnerable, but it was fun when it did what it was supposed to do. It was fun. But yeah, back to what you said. I, I do wish the party mechanic was more powerful. Um, I can only assume. All right. Well, I guess um, that's sort of our main topic for the week. So I guess we can sort of get on into the um, sideboard card of the week. Sure. Um, my personal one was Crown Hunter Hireling. Um, sorry, I'm just going to pull up exactly what it does. That way, again, I don't get sure anything wrong but um yeah basically it is a 4-4 creature for a red and four um, whenever it enters, enters battlefield you become the monarch and it can't attack unless the defending player is the monarch <clears throat> um i really like the design space of this card in that it can only attack um like if your opponent is the monarch so it's only ever going to be something that helps you steal the monarch but with popper becoming even yeah and i more, think that's uh that's that yeah Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, with Popper becoming even more of like um like monarch centric, at least um for the next couple of weeks probably while people sort of adapt. Having this sort of card in the side blue red decks or something like that, something like that to just like <clears throat> after you've sort of battled over the monarch like in the air and with your uh, falcons and stuff, just having like a trump card of going, I'm going to steal the monarch back one last time and untap my stuff or whatever is um <clears throat> 
something that I think will be pretty powerful coming up. And I recommend that people at least try this card out. I know that I have, and I've been loving it. Yeah, it was not available on MTGO for a long time. I wonder if, uh, I think they finally put it in maybe in over the summer, late spring, early summer, sometime around there. I wonder if they did that because they knew what was coming with Commander Legends or if it was just coincidence or I'm not really sure. But yeah, you're right. The Its ability is different. It, it's very interesting um, and it's very relevant right now, as a matter of fact. So there's a pretty good chance that on any given match, your opponent's going to be the Monarch at one point or another. I definitely agree. Yep. What was your uh, sideboard card for the week? Well, I also had a red card. Um, mine is a little bit cheaper. It's an instant. It is uh, one red and one for flaring bit cheaper. It's an instant. It is uh, one red and one for flaring pain from Judgment. Uh, it's one of my favorite sets. I love the old borders, the old artwork. Uh, the flaring pain, like I said, is red and one. For an instant, damage cannot be prevented this turn, and it flashbacks from your graveyard for a single red. Uh, that last little bit, the flashback, is what makes this card as good as it is, in my opinion. Um, and I, I think it was just coincidence, but I think the fla- Flaring Pain is going to play a lot into the Monarch format that we're going into now. That way, you know, you can't fog out um, an attack. You can't keep your opponent from stealing the monarchy from you. can't keep your opponent from fogging out your attack. I think that's going to become very relevant pretty soon. Um, you see it almost at least a one of in, in most decks that play red. I think it, it's fallen out of favor a little bit. Um, I don't know, no pun intended, I guess. <laughs> but it, I would I would be surprised if it didn't come back in some capacity uh, with the mind. Yeah. Um, flaring Pain is um, one of those cards that I think most people hate to love. And yes. That whenever absolutely. it's played against you, it feels pretty bad. Playing it feels excellent. And it's probably yeah. one of those like necessary <laughs> evils. So. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. Uh, you always kind of giggle when you play it, and you always cuss when it's played against you. you know? <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, well, I guess that'll do it for this episode of Common Knowledge. If you guys wanted to get in touch with us, you can find me on Twitter at just for b um, He's also Brad Drac V on MTGO. Or you can shoot us an email over at commonknowledgemtg at gmail.com. If you guys have any questions about performing anything in life, you can leave a comment as well. <clears throat> Thanks again to our sponsor, puremtgo.com, as well as, as well as the court for letting us be a part of it. Um, once again, thank you, Brad, for um, being with us and sort of joining CK. Um, it's no, going to be absolutely. a lot of fun. Um, we're really excited to have such like a huge part of the online popper community as a part of the show. So, well, I, I appreciate it. it. It is a very big honor, and I I hope to uh, do my predecessors well. I'm proud, but we'll see how it goes. But I do. Um, I am very appreciative for the opportunity. Thank you, Christian yeah. and Spencer yeah. and everybody in the uh, Constructed Criticism Network. <clears throat> yeah. Um, well, last but certainly not least, take care of every each other, everybody, and uh, never stop and brewing. We'll see you next time. Brewing. We'll see you next time.